Good afternoon, folks. Purple Crown here coming to you from Vancouver, British Columbia. This is a round 10 allied summary of Global War 1939 YouTube Awards against Hunt Like David. Uh, we are going to call it here at the end of round 10 when, when Italy goes uh, as an allied victory. The Axis currently have 10 victory cities. They're going to likely would achieve 11 and maybe even less depending on what the allies do in the pacific this is the current state of affairs so there is four american transports just off the cost off the coast of madras also a portuguese transport which is their british units with the transport as well so there's 10 units here that can go in either direction whether to liberate singapore which they can whether to go and reinforce cairo which is probably going to fall last turn the germans they went into turkey so they took the most west territory of istanbul and came down to baku and so uh currently round 10 and this is now a will, would be a 14 round game so they would go one two three four uh and same with these forces here one two three four so round 14 they would be able to, I don't think there's anything the allies could do to reinforce, even with their fortification. This large stack over here, this large stack here, uh, it's gonna be about 45 units coming in without their air force. And even though Britain has two industrial complexes here, one in Alexandria, one in Cairo, uh, likely uh, <laughs> not able to, get 50 or 60 units there in time uh, even though they've got a uh, military base down here in, in Rhodesia and with South, South Africa bringing guys up even if these forces were all to make their way over it is likely uh, doomsday so what did the British do this turn while well, they from their air base here in Alexandria they attacked the Italian fleet which was Two Ital or four Italian destroyers, two uh, Vichy French destroyers, a Vichy French submarine, and two Italian cruisers, and a scramble of one fighter in this sea zone here. It was basically mutual destruction. The British did not want the Italians having any navy in the Med at all, and so they were successful. They did survive the battle with two Spitfires, which landed over here in Malta, so they are safe for now. Um, that was just kind of a last round. We knew it was going to be the last round, so you may as well just take them out uh, while you had the chance. Over here in the Pacific, this is kind of where the Allies did most of their damage. So the Japanese, this is their surviving fleet. They built an, a naval base here off the coast of, or basically, yeah, the, the territory of Iwo Jima. So the a naval base repaired all of their damaged four damaged battleships. So they were able to make some, you know, basically last stand for Japanese if this game game was to go on for another turn. But the Allies were successful in liberating the Philippines. They were also successful. Japan flew most of its air force, a big portion of it in Hong Kong. So there was a big battle there. And the Japanese uh, did lose. So this territory would likely ping pong back and forth a few more turns. Japan does have one transport left on the board uh, they actually built three and two destroyers there so i called this the gargantua attack this is the kind of attacks that he does which are successful when he does them so i felt confident i was feeling it so uh the alone anzac destroyer from sea zone here 117 went up one two and attacked two destroyers and three transports and it took out actually both destroyers before it was sunk. And then a B-17 heavy American bomber came on the following turn and was able to sink two more transports before it was shot down uh, by a transport returning fire. So that was kind of a fun attack, but that is severely going to limit the Japanese sneak or counter attack. Uh, so they're, if they're only able to move around two units next turn and you know gargantua also says wisely that the scariest unit on the board particularly for japan and maybe even the allies in the pacific is the transport 
because it's the transport that is the lifeline for Japan to be able to get resources, uh, men and material, over to wherever they're trying to defend. Uh, Japan did do a attack here from Siam into Burma, and they lost, I think, 18 units and killed six. So next turn, if the British wanted to take a poke at Siam, they probably would. So this territory here would be withered down uh, until probably the Allies would be successful in eliminating the Japanese and taking taking Singapore. So that would also kind of limit what the Japanese, as their economy slowly shrinks. They don't have many ground forces left here on mainland of Asia. The Russians, despite uh, their limited resources, were able to kill a couple of Japanese units that uh, were over in the CCP territory, and they are ready to sort of launch back into these territories down here, Northern Manchuria, Manchuria next turn. And then Japan does have an amphibious tank and a couple of units here sitting in, what's that territory? Vladivostok. So America, you know, its Navy is slightly bigger than the Japanese Navy over here sitting in Hawaii. They did put up a couple blockers and they've got a couple naval transports to, you know, go into the Philippines if they want next turn. And they've got a follow-up Navy there with another carrier and a couple of battleships. So Japan just simply can't keep pace. Over here, Anzac's building more transports to come across. They've got a couple military bases now producing one infantry a turn in Dutch East Indies and over here in Java. So they would be able to continually just harass the Japanese from the south. Uh, over here, defending the, the pseudo-capital of Russia is sort of a ragtag force of Russians that, uh, you know, basically are there just in case, you know, the Germans wanted to keep heading east. But Germans have their eye on the victory cities. Um, Novosibirsk is not a victory city. Over here in the Atlantic, the Germans sort of abandoned the idea of sea lion and they just basically reinforced Paris. So not a lot happening here late in play. Now, Germany doing this in the game was good. We tested to see what would happen, but in doing that and kind of delayed the Germans, if they were going to mount a serious effort to sort of capture Calcutta and Cairo, which they might've been able to do had they not spent, you know, basically building 14 transports here, uh, you know, for Germany, which that could have been, you know, fort, what is 14, 10 times, 14 times seven is, you know, that, that's a that's a significant amount of tanks. It easily could have headed towards uh, Calcutta or Cairo. Over here, sort of, uh, Germany did build six more destroyers next turn and five submarines. So there would have been a potential, another attempt at a sea line, but now that the Germans pulled out, uh, you know, it's very, very unlikely London would ever be captured. So, but the Americans and the Canadians and the British were spending a little bit here every turn just to reinforce it, just to make sure that it was that it was safe for the remainder of the game. The Americans uh, did uh, basically now have full control of South Africa. So what did we learn in this game? Uh, for the Japanese, uh, seem to be uh, where they may have lost momentum was not being quick enough to capture, uh, and this was talking with Hunt Lake David, some of these uh, money islands down here by round three. This was his assessment that Japan, when they do their J1 attack, they need to be able to secure as much money as they can. So they were slow on the draw there. And that was in part because the KMT uh, liberated the Burma Road from the Japanese and the Japanese just were not able to punch through. They, you know, spent a lot of money and resources, the KMT defending the Burma Road, which is tied to their NO bonus of five. And they almost stayed in control of all of their territories, losing, you know, a few here and a few there, but for the entire game, and they just kept nibbing, sort of being a pain in the neck 
of the Japanese, you know, killing a unit here, a unit there, this constant battle that Japan was never sort of able to gain the, the edge. Also, the CCP was just kind of at a standoff. Same with the Russians that came down into Manchuria with the Japanese, but that pre prevented Japan from getting all those almost, I think at one time it was well over 20 ground forces for the Japanese from jumping on transports and going to maybe take a poke at Calcutta, you know, coming down here, maybe taking a, a run at Sydney or even Hawaii. So that kind of hampered Japan um, just enough to allow the Americans to, to eventually come in and sort of be at naval parity with Japan, even if they were slightly below. This naval battle here, you know, Japan won the fight, uh, but in doing so, they lost the war because America's Navy is now larger than Japan. So those were some significant factors that maybe we learned this game. Uh, and over here, you know, the attempt at Sea Lion, uh, you know, I saw it coming. So in my experience that if the allies, you know, and this is in different variants as well, sort of have an inkling or a heads up that Sea Lion is going to happen, being able to reinforce London in a very quick and efficient manner is the best way to defend it. And you basically, at that point, it becomes a, almost a easier for the allies to defend than it is for the Axis to take. Uh, and that kind of happened there, sort of, sort of for Sea Lion to be successful, um, at least in my opinion, you almost have to, you know, in a scenario where the Allies spent heavily in Africa, which they did, but almost to ca catch them napping for, um, you know, when the Germans get their transports in the water, or at least money to do that, um, have their units ready to go, and a large navy, and all of a sudden they're building transports, and now it's too late to reinforce. So it was this game was a lot closer than maybe the victory cities tell now, but uh, but it was a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun playing with Hunt Like David. Consider him a friend now. Um, you know, my, <laughs> we've been bantering back and forth in the rules. Uh, one variant or one slight rule change we did make is that Russia. Uh, cannot declare war on Japan until turn two. And we moved a couple of the starting Russian forces from Novosibirsk over to Stalingrad. Not their fast movers, but some of their units that move one territory per turn, just to kind of take a little bit of the teeth away from the Russians, should they go full, the Allies go full Japan, so that... Uh, you know, to give the Japanese a, a fighting chance should the Allies go dogpile Japan, which was a very successful strategy for them. And uh, so we will, we will, uh, you know, I'll likely do, uh, you know, maybe more of an assessment if you guys have any questions or follow up. But uh, stay tuned. Uh, Hunt like David and the Hilltop Pillbox are arranging a YouTube Wars game, so I'm gonna stay tuned for that. And possibly uh, Steven Gelso the Mo from the Mofo Brothers and myself might engage in our own YouTube Wars 39. Uh, it'd be great to see him uh, finally play. Uh, but yeah, it was a great game. And thanks for watching and stay tuned, folks.